Today's speaker, Derek Birke, uh, many of you or some of you may know him from his book he wrote about seven, eight years ago? 2010. 2010. When will the lights go out? A pertinent question we've been asking for a number of years, and people always conclude that and say it's impossible. You know, we're an advanced economy, impossible that that would ever happen. And guess what? Um, we're phasing out coal, um, we are killing fracking. Um, we are um, we have a problem with nuclear energy because no one really wants to invest anymore. It's too expensive, and so the question really is: is you know the rush into renewables the solution to the energy question? And Derek, who has worked all his life in the energy sector and is an expert on this issue, will tell us where, where the renewables can save us from the lights going out, and what will it cost? <laughs> there it is. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone, and uh, th th thank you, Benny. Now, um, energy is the basis of our living standards, and we've seen electricity prices double over the last decade. And you know, people should really understand why this has happened. And um, uh, there's the, the the state has discouraged fossil fuels, and um, uh, and of course, fossil fuels are the cheapest. They're the ones that you know we should be using. And, and what's been lost with all this urge for renewables is it has to have backup capacity, and this backup capacity is not being built, or in very small quantities. It's, it, it, there's, a, there's a looming problem here, which I'll go into later. Now, these are the targets that were put out by the EU. This is the main one, uh, showing the, and the proportion of what is produced by electricity. And it comes to about 54%. Uh, now, that's quite a... For 54% of the... Uh, EU targets to come through um, uh, ele uh, electricity is a, a wholly disproportionate share of energy end use, and I'll show you why. But these targets were based, as you probably all know, on 1990 levels. Uh, they wanted a reduction of 20% in the EU. The UK negotiated a 15% figure, but Germany, they had a 40% figure. And you can understand why they're going to be real problems, because their estimate, which is officially recognised in Germany, is that they're only going to meet about 32% of the 40. So there's going, to be a few, there's going to be a few repercussions on that one. Now, this is a simplification of a diagram that uh, comes out every year by what used to be DEC, is now DBIS, but... On the left-hand side here, you have the, uh, the input of fuels. On the right-hand side, you have the end use. Coal. I think coal is essential in the generation mix. You cannot just have gas turbines alone. You have to have coal as well. For one very good, simple reason, and that is you can put a, a year's supply of coal at site. And a tremendous, that's a tremendous security consideration. With gas, you've got the NGLs being used, and notice that the amount of gas that goes into the industrial sector is a much lower proportion than what you've got going to power stations and for domestic. And if ever you run out of legroom, in a sense, of using industry to uh, and this has happened several times already, where gas supply has been restricted. You're forced into domestic or electricity supply. And, uh, and it, the, your safety risks with domestic uh, disconnection are tremendous. So what will happen if once your source of taking in uh, gas supply from industries, you're just left with... Um, Electricity to go off. 
You know, and this is, this is another reason why you, you, you really have to have some alternative. And you cannot be unduly, you're bound to be dependent, of course, to a degree, but you cannot be unduly dependent upon one single source. And if you're going to run an electricity grid supply, you have to have dispatchable plant. And you'll, you'll see why later on. But dispatchable plant is very important. And uh, you, not just for the production needs, but for covering the standby capacity for wind. And with the wind going up and up and up, so is your standby capacity going to go up and up. And you'll see why later. Coming into wind became the dominant technology that was being used for renewables. And in the last decade, the House of Lords had various inquiries. And the, the load factor that was put forward at those inquiries was 35%. And this figure was used in all the planning applications. Now, in fact, if you take a 10-year average, which came about from the... Um, uh, from the, uh, the use of uh, the renewables obligation, where people were paid on the energy they produced. And that gave a very good indication what load factors were being done. And this came, this averaged out about, over a decade, about 26%. Now, between 35 and 26, that's one huge economic hit. But it did nothing to discourage them because the, the subsidies were so generous. And it just kept on rolling. And there's other factors, of course, that encourage them, but that's something that um, people should be aware of. And, um, and also, the cost of all these renewables is being met by the electricity consumer. And it doesn't have parliamentary scrutiny like it should have. This is another serious uh, problem. There's also been a failure to monitor targets and performance, <coughs> and that any competent uh, use of resources and, and, and uh, is to monitor what you're actually doing and achieving. And this doesn't seem to have happened at all in all this green uh, uh, arrangement that's been going on. And I'll give two very good examples. The carbon balance, in that when you have to, you've got to have standby capacity. And this standby capacity is running at low levels, so it's inefficient. So there's a carbon penalty. And if a break, there's a break-even point that comes when you, the, the, the carbon that you're building up and what you're saving by having wind in the first place, you get to a point where they meet. Now, th I've never seen a calculation on this. And the, uh, it was done for the Netherlands and it was done for Ireland. And they, came, uh, 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 they said the same as, you know, it derives me. Coming on to wind. Now, the characteristics of the wind, this is a typical uh, performance graph of output um, against wind speed. And uh, you can see that there's certain points of this curve that are very, very sensitive to wind speed changes. But you really do get the problem when you have an excessive wind at this point, when it's shut down for safety. And that can have a considerable effect on the system. So this is the problem of variation of output. You'll see a graph of this later on. But that is a, a fundamental problem with wind resource. You have these, uh, these, these certain sections of wind speed that vary. The argument is, is that if you have so many of these, they'll tend to, the effects will tend to level themselves out. But nevertheless, there's still a problem there. And you can't assume that the grid can cope with a, a, an excursion um, of, of demand, um, uh, uh, of wind demand, being able to cope with it, as you can for a normal TV pickup, for example. The two situations are totally different because you've no anticipation. These things come out of the blue and it's quite a different, uh, you, you cannot assume that the a three and a half gigawatt variation that you can cope with normally for the grid is, can be done for the same for wind. You can't. Now this is the... Uh, it illustrates the sensitivity and the vulnerability of electricity supply. Uh, this is a, is a frequency 
um, and you maintain the frequencies maintained between operationally between these two levels. Statutory so statutory requirements is you never go below <coughs> this figure here, forty nine point five, and this is an occasion where there was various faults. This sort of thing is fairly routine of losing the odd bit of generation capacity. That's nothing new at all. It's easy to cope with. But then this happened, and this was the largest single event loss that could come on the system. This was sizeable tipping out. And with such a big bump on the system, there was a bit of sympathetic tripping that came with it. And then this seemed to level itself out, and suddenly it dipped down here. And that triggered um, what uh, it triggered automatically triggered uh, frequency relays at distribution points, which dropped off about half a gigawatt, uh, half of a gigawatt of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of consumers. And it took a long, slow crawl back to get back. So you had a nine minute period here. Th this whole thing is just in 15 minutes. And that is what the problem is. You have to maintain a balance of 50 cycles or near enough it within that range. And that's where, uh, that is the, 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 what's termed load balancing. And that's a very important function. You also have voltage to consider on the grid system. It's just as important that you get the volts right on the system. And with fluctuations of wind, you know, this becomes more and more of a problem. But that, uh, that gives you a nature of what, what can happen. And uh, if you look at it too closely, you'll find that the loss of generation here was very similar to that. But the reason why that was so pronounced was because you have a, a governor effect. And it, uh, it's a, Steve's got to catch up with the, uh, the actual power that comes out. So I won't, that's a bit complicated, but it, it, um, uh, it goes to show just the, uh, the sensitivity that what can happen. And the real problem is not a single fault, it's all the bits and pieces that come with it. The whole point is these frequency relays are there to prevent the whole system collapsing. But there are certain circumstances where this doesn't happen. And this happened in South Australia. And the fundamental cause of that, uh, a couple of years ago now, but the fundamental cause of that was that there was too much wind on the system. And the measures that were in place to try and cover it weren't sufficient. And it happened twice. And they're still having problems in Australia. So, you know, this is going to happen here uh, at some stage. Now, this, is the, this gives an idea of the number of startups that's expected. This is... Uh, this was done on the, uh, by the um, uh, a paper that was produced by the National Grid, and this was in um, uh, 2009. And it's an indication of what they were expecting for the number of, uh, uh, with increasing wind, it's an exponential function of it increasing. And that, of course, has all sorts of repercussions practically with the, with the equipment uh, the plant using and, and, uh, and its life. This is where we come to the um, standby capacity. Here you have the different levels. This is where you have the um, uh, a no wind scenario would be reasonably normal, where you have to have uh, a rain, um, uh, standby capacity for plant falling off or demand estimation errors, um, and uh, um, you've got to cover the single event loss. So these are basic functions of standby capacity. But when you introduce wind, then you have to have additional support. And for, this is a sort of average figure for wind at 30%, probably a bit less. But if you're up to full wind, which you have to cater for, I'm not saying it happens often, but you have to cater for it, you need the capacity, and by 2020, with 27 gigawatt of wind, they're expecting about 12 gigawatt of uh, standby capacity to be available to cover all these. And that is where the problem's coming. Wind has been coming on and it's not catching, the standby 
capacity is not uh, is not uh, keeping up with it. Because you've also got production demands to, to be met as well, not just standby capacity. And this is why dispatchable power is so important. And really, <coughs> very little has happened over the last decade. Now this gives an idea of um, in January, 12th, uh, January 2010, this is the normal demand curve that would normally have to be met. You can see the weekends and you've got a, a variation of around 15 gigawatt. Um, and then using the wind conditions that were experienced in that period and um, exploration it to um, 27 gigawatt of wind would give you a, a curve like this. So you can see the, the, the variation, the fluctuation involved. Now that has to be met by standby capacity. And the next diagram, that is what the thermal generation has to cope with. And you're getting swings here of about 35 gigawatt. You see my point about increasing uh, use of standby generation. This is what I was referring to earlier, where you have a basic reserve, a reserve for response to cover your um, estimation of plant loss and single event loss is here at the bottom. But there, on top of it, you can see the fluctuation of uh, cover that's needed for wind. This is the wind generation um, in Scotland that was monitored by the grid um, in Scotland. And you had about two gigawatt of capacity. And you can see this drop here. This is over the 48, uh, four, this is a single day. You can see the variation. And the important thing is, it's not consistent, you know, this sort of thing, which makes it very difficult to uh, adjust to. So this is another problem that you've got with wind, when you have cutoff through high winds. This is the variation that you can get. And, and this, uh, so you've got to transpose this over the whole system to realise what a problem that could become. And this is where you get into the realms of how to cope with intermittence and why people are needing, um, uh, talking about uh, um, uh, smart metering. This was produced at the beginning of 2011. And what's happened since is coal, as you can see, the cumulative being taken off, oil at the bottom, nuclear, and the gas turbines start to come off. And what's replacing it? Well, the gas turbines haven't, which is what, what was intended. You're not getting any nuclear, which was intended, and all you're getting is wind. So there's going to be a problem. And the <laughs> scale of this problem is enormous. And this is where your costs are coming in. Anyway, I'll finish there. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry.